Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Should I tap on the microphone thing? No? I like to start off with uh, a good dad joke. Anybody a new dad? This is the comedy show, right? <laughs> so, do you know why you never see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at it. Nothing? Thank you. There we go. All right, so on to the show. Uh, my name is Joel Christner. I'm with Dell. I'm joined uh, by Alessia Morelli, CTO of DNA Algo, and Mark Wilcox. They had no idea that this was going to be a comedy show. <laughs> We're going to talk about the uh, Rosetta Stone initiative. It's a project that we are uh, working on with uh, a, a very good group of people to help bootstrap DNA data storage archives. I do want to uh, put a plug in for the first white paper out of the DNA Data Storage Alliance on preserving our digital legacy. There's a lot of graphics and data that we've taken from that paper. There's a lot of really good information uh, contained within it. I would highly encourage you to uh, take a look through it. As far as the agenda for the session today, we have four items to cover. First is we're gonna go through uh, the differences, some of the main primary differences between DNA as a data storage media versus what we would consider to be traditional media. We're going to jump into an overview of the Rosetta Stone initiative and what we're doing, why we're doing it, uh, where we are and where it's headed, and then a brief call to action on how to participate and then we'll close up with a summary. Sound good? All right. So differences between DNA and traditional media. Anybody here a uh, storage veteran? Lots of time in the storage industry. Any chemists in the room? All right, no chemists in the room. Great. So I like to uh, look at things through um, the lens of analogy when trying to dissect them. I I've been in the storage industry for 25 years. Um, I'm a storage geek, not a chemist. Just had a personal interest in DNA data storage and thought to myself, why not just jump into the deep end? I'm part of the research and development office in the office of the CTO at Dell, and was given the green light to, to go ahead and participate. Wanted to get right into the deep end of the pool, and um, I like to live in the world of analogy by trying to understand one thing through the lens of another. When I think about DNA as a data storage media type, um, I, I naturally start thinking about other types of storage media, whether that's NAND or if that's tape. And all of the things that have to happen in between that media type and the system and the application that's trying to consume it. So we have a, a simple block diagram of a typical SSD where you have some kind of controller interface, you have some pool of uh, flash memory behind that, and there's this series of abstractions that happen where the controller understands how data is posited onto the underlying memory in order to expose the entirety of the system itself toward the consumer of that resource so that it can be used. Lots of different layers of abstraction have to happen. What we think of as LBA0 from a SCSI perspective probably does not cleanly map to what we see on the, I think this is a, should I shine it in my eye? There we go to the flash memory that you see on the right. Some series of abstractions have to happen in order to make that useful and usable. Similarly, once you expose that device using some series of standards to the operating system, the operating system is going to put its own set of abstractions on top of that in order to turn this logical block device into something consumable like a file system. So you have, again, another set of abstractions that have to be layered on top of the abstractions that are on top of the physical media. Now, the nice thing about SSDs is they have a built-in controller, right? It's great. They expose metadata to the operating system. We can open up disk management on this laptop and take a look and see who manufactured the SSD and look at its geometry. We can look at all kinds of other fun pieces of data that nerds like me would really enjoy looking at, right? Some types of media, uh, like tape, don't have that same benefit. 
right? They don't have a built-in controller. You need a drive for it. You have some metadata that is external to the media. You have some metadata uh, in the broader system that is storing all of these cartridges. Well, what you do have is the barcode with the metadata and you have your proximity from the beginning or the end of the tape and an understanding of the file system that is laid out on that tape. So with DNA, you don't have those, which presents an interesting challenge. We've got this, somebody said, these little containers of goop. Who, who was that? Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a nickel every time I use that because that is perfect, right? There's these little things with goop and you have no idea what's in them. It's just some chemical and we have to somehow put some kind of usable interface on top of that. And that's you know, really the core of what we're doing in the Rosetta Stone group. It's actually not that, it's just making it possible so that you can put a file system or some other type of interface on top of this, this goop substrate. So a brief primer, uh, and you know, I'm not trying to be redundant with uh, what Dave already covered in his session, but there are a, a few uh, nuances that I do wanna point out uh, that are important as we get into uh, the discussion about the Rosetta Stone project. So the first is, the fundamental unit of storage is an oligonucleotide, also called an oligo, which is a short strand of uh, synthetic DNA or RNA. It's, uh, you can think of the, the, the strands themselves as um, the backbone. Those are, as Dave mentioned, typically a sugar phosphate. The uh, connections between them are the base compounds. That's the ACTG, uh, so adenine, cytosine, thymine, guanine, uh, those attach to the strand and to one another. So there's a, a, like a mating type of process that happen and they have you know, natural, um, natural affinity towards one another. So uh, A and T, G and C, and there's four of them, right? If you go into RNA, there's another one, which is the letter U, but you know, four is a nice binary, you know, two to the power of two type of thing. So you can see a very clear path to go from uh, base two into, uh, into a four, four base type of system. So as Dave mentioned earlier, this is the end-to-end -end, um, progression that you go through for writing and then reading data from a DNA archive. The first thing that you have to do is encode your digital data into the bases. There's a, a whole lot of opportunity for innovation in the codex base to include things like uh, error correction, detection, compression, et cetera. There's a lot of work being done there to help mitigate some of the challenges that you run into when you have a, uh, uh, a, a strand or a series of strands that have a higher concentration of different types of bases than others. So there's a lot of work being done there. Once the data is coded, uh, the process of synthesis is what actually writes it quote unquote. From there you store it and then when you need to retrieve it, you find the container that has the goop that you need, you dissect that, you sequence it, and then you decode uh, back from the bases to the binary bits. And that's what we just talked through right there. So the interesting thing about DNA again is it doesn't have this concept of addressable sectors. It doesn't have a relative position. If you think about just oligonucleotides floating in some substance in a sealed container, you know, somebody could take that container and shake it up, right? So the strand might not be in the same place. Uh, it might just be naturally moving inside the container. So there's no concept of proximity. I can't ask a container, can you give me sector zero? Because it has no concept of sector zero. You potentially yes, but then you would have to find that long strand, and that long strand could have moved, right? So that's a really good question. So without this concept of a location, proximity to start or finish, or addressable sectors, we have a natural challenge. We want to put a file. I like to use the file system as the canonical example, right? That's what we interact with the most, I think. If we want to put a file system on this type of media, what do we need to do? 
So one last thing I want to cover uh, as, a, uh, as a primer before we jump into an overview of the Rosetta Stone is uh, the concept of a primer. I'm going to give you a primer on a primer. A primer is a short stretch of DNA. It's, uh, it's targeting a specific sequence. So remember, Dave mentioned that A naturally wants to bond with T and C with G. These primers, I like to think of them as magnets, right? They, they naturally attach to strands that are incident to your interest. So if you're looking for a strand containing a certain amount of data and you understand what part of that strand looks like, you can use a primer to attach to that strand. You then go through a process called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, and that is used to create one or many copies of that strand once you've used a primer to attach to that strand. So when you go to extract data from an archive, one way to do that, I shouldn't say from an archive, but from DNA, one way to do that is through the use of primers. So with these primers, you can attach to uh, strands that have the complement of that primer. And it might be a short section, as you can see here. So you have what is called a front primer and a back primer. And it naturally matches to these bases here. And once you have that, you capture the entirety there, and you now have access to everything that lies in between. Yeah. So that's basically the key. You know, the value, the key yeah. passage, the yes, that's a, yep. All right, so we'll jump into an overview of the Rosetta Stone project. So the big problem is uh, DNA does not share the properties found in other types of data storage media. There's uh, no built-in controller. There's no concept of a logical address. We have no understanding of the proximity of a certain strand from the beginning or the end of the archive. Uh, so it's unstructured. It is you know, literally no different than uh, magnetic tape, except the regions of the tape could be floating around inside this container. There are many different mechanisms uh, for encoding data into DNA. Um, and we want to give vendors and uh, academia and other uh, industry constituents the freedom to innovate in how they write to DNA. But what we do want to make sure that we do is look at this through the lens of a potential 100-year lifespan. How do we craft uh, a common path that everyone can follow to be able to understand the construction of the archive to then be able to consume the balance of it? So we don't want to preclude any vendor from potentially using some novelty in their codec to provide some value in terms of how they write to the DNA. But if we come up with a common format that provides a descriptor for that archive, that descriptor can then contain the information about the codec that was used such that somebody wanting to consume the archive could then use that information, retrieve the codec, and then consume the archive itself. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Alessia. And Alessia, if you'd like to take us through the Rosetta Stone project. <laughs> okay, so um, 
Generally, this translation is managed by a part of the, of the operating system, which is the file system in this case. Um, as Joel pointed out here, we do not have uh, a controller with the DNA media. And there is also no addressing by a real linear address or by location. So, uh, and there is also no file system. So how can we communicate with the boot record of the DNA archive? How do we boot, for example, an SSD? Here, the, it is a picture of a standard SSD. We have a controller. We have all the channels where all the NAND are attached. And we have also the square prompt. So first thing the controller does is read the information from the square prompt in order to understand, basically, the hardware configuration. What is stored in the square prompt is the type of NAND that are on the channel, how to address them, for example, uh, which are the timings, uh, the vendor ID, and also the type of ECC that, are, that he needs to use in order to access the data stored in the NAND. Of course, data in the square prompt must be reliable. So generally speaking, it is protected by an error correction code. After that, so uh, the controller has all the information in order to be able to access the NAND. He knows the address, he knows the kind of NAND, and he knows the timings. So he is able to access really the NAND. So what is stored in all the block zero of the NAND is basically the firmware. So in order to boot an SSD, we have two reads, basically. One read from the square prom in order to understand how to access the hardware, and then loading the firmware itself from the block zero. Of course, the block zero must contain reliable information because they are key. They are all the metadata, all the, all the firmware in order to SSD to, to be able to boot. So he has the information about ECC, so in, in order to decode information read from the block zero. And the block zero needs to be a good, a good block. So that's the reason why typically NAND vendors guarantee the block zero to be accessible and to be a good block. What if we want to boot a machine from an SSD? In this case, of course, the SSD boot itself. And then the machine asks for sector zero in this case. Sector zero, the controller knows what it is. So he asks for sector zero, which is the master boot record to the controller. The controller understands that what the, the, the machine needs is are all the metadata, and he knows where they are stored. It can be also um, not in a zero location, let me say, but must be a reliable information that the controller knows because it is key in order the machine to be able to boot. But what happens here? Here, we do not have anything. We just have a capsule with DNA stored inside. So um, we do not have a controller. And the metadata are mixed within the archive itself. So we need a way to discriminate them in order to be able to boot the archive and also for example, in key information, such vendor ID or the error correction code used in the archive itself is mixed within the archive itself. So it, it's, it, it's quite strange because we need to access the archive, but we do not have the information in order to be able to access them in a reliable way. Um, so basically, we need a way to be able to access the archive from a first pass, let me say, and be able to read the key information in order to be able to boot the archive itself. And basically, this is what uh, the project Rosetta Stone tries to do. So um, Rosetta Stone project is part of the DNA Storage uh, Alliance, as Dave mentioned before. So it's a, it's a subgroup. And basically, in this picture, we have all the archive. So there are the data specific from the company, which are here in green. And then within the data itself, so within the archive itself, we have the descriptor data, which, which are the like the metadata, the information needed in order to boot the archive. What are the goals of our project, uh, of Rosetta Stone project? Um, 
we need basically a common identifier in order to be able universally to bootstrap a DNA archive. We need to be able to identify where the key information about the codec are stored within the archive itself. But on the same time, we just want to be able to identify where the key information of the codec are, but to enable information because we want to let the flexibility to all the company to use the code that they want. Yes. So that means that there's a limitation on the, uh, the character set that could be bit patterns and things like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And of course, we want to provide also faster access to metadata because they are the key data in order to be able to read the archive. Of course, when we want to find out uh, a universal way to find out this information, we, have, we use some working assumption. So uh, we assume that uh, a, generally doc a general document about specification is accessible. We as uh, assume that the um, archive boot are built with natural DNA, so the standard base is ACGT, but the archive itself may also contain different bases, non-natural. Uh, remember that we are talking about um, a huge uh, retention. So this archiving may be accessed in 100 years. So we need to some, something like forecast what, what can happen in 100 years when someone wants to read the data. Um, we need a way standard to let the reader of the archive able to identify where the key information about the error correction code are stored. We assume that in, in some way the, 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 the user that wants to read the archive has some form of connectivity, internet con connectivity. And we also assume uh, that the, prima, the um, primary use of a DNA is a write once archive. So basically not data that are read too many times, it's an archive basically. Now I'll let uh, the podium to Mark. Right. All right, I don't have a, don't worry, I don't have any, too many more slides. Um, so the uh, project is uh, like a working group. Uh, there's various different perspectives and technologies uh, between the digital side and the, you know, the molecular side. Um, so the working group is really to get together and provide those different perspectives. It's been quite productive uh, already today. So there's sort of like, uh, we're identifying all these different, uh, I would say like parameters, where in order to build a model and understand, hey, what's the, you know, for example, just the, just the example there of, hey, uh, mixing uh, of the metadata versus the user data, what are the statistical error rates and things. We need to be able to actually not just have a general notion of them, but to be able to say, hey, this is the exact length, uh, this is how it corresponds to a certain error rate, and so forth. So we're sort of stacking up these decisions to make, and I expect that this, this list is uh, going to get a bit longer. But at the moment, you know, we're looking at, we need to agree upon what's that minimum length of an oligonucleotide, specific, and we're talking specifically for this sector zero, like this first sector, in order to read the archive, where there's the code, once you get the codec, then that opens up all kinds of different opportunities. Um, and then, you know, closely related to that is that error recovery metric and the mechanism uh, uh, for that. Uh, another uh, uh, active discussion is uh, like how many sectors we may want to standardize. So there may be other, uh, you know, sector one or sector two uh, kind of uh, um, areas that could get uh, standardized maybe in, in an open source codec. Uh, and the progress to date essentially is that we've already started uh, seeing several proposals. So there's uh, proposals being drafted uh, and discussed. 
uh, they're covering the sector zero uh, implementation, how those uh, identifiers are constructed, um, and uh, then even looking at in, into uh, what uh, you know, what kind of contents are we expecting that different vendors may want to be including uh, in that uh, in that payload and the various uh, meanings of them. Um, so there's a lot of active discussion at the moment, and it's still quite early in the working group. But we're kind of working towards, hey, what exactly are the, um, the you know, error rates and, and recoverability processes that we need to be able to deal with? Uh, and we're kind of looking at, well, what, what's the roadmap for this whole initiative, really? Uh, so we expect that you know the proposals that are there today are only just the start, and, and that we'll get more. We'll see new versions of, of those existing proposals, and we'll see you know uh, more vendors joining uh, joining the working group. Uh, but there's essentially, you know, a, a, a key uh, deliverable that we're kind of working towards, which is the uh, documenting it in a standard document that we all uh, sign off and, and agree upon. Uh, and there's some sort of like policy and procedural documentation around, you know, how that standard may be uh, expanded or or ad adjusted and updated and, and tested uh, over time. Uh, but a key discussion in the, in the group is basically having a registry uh, of codex. Cool, and so the, if we step back, you know, what's this Rosetta Stone? If we get the Sector Zero and we can manage to boot an archive, what does that enable? Well, it's really like the, the main blocker, it's the main uh, 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 element that we need to actually go off and start creating drives where you could have some integration and have some protocol because you can decouple the, the drive from, from all of the, the software and drivers and whatever we don't even know at the moment like how these uh, uh, things will look so put controllers the uh, drivers the ecosystem but basically agreeing on a decoding standard enables vendors to start working on uh, consumers of that uh, that first sector the zero sector uh, uh, interesting uh, comment earlier was you know how do you uh, understand or reason about the state of the system so I uh, expect that that will uh, quickly uh, come up as, a, as the next sort of uh, aspect, which is how do you uh, check a smart status uh, for some strands that are floating around? Um, and so I, I, I would expect that, you know, once we get the identified way that we encoder the first sector and we can start registering metadata, then we can go, hey, how do we, what, how, how can we expand the error model, for example, in order to reason about things like that? Uh, uh, Extra uh, sort of uh, aspect to this is that DNA, because it's based on the identity, because the way that we're looking at the how to interpret the drive, it's based on the sort of the allocation of uh, identify identifiers. It's sort of like IPv6 addresses, uh, if you think about that, less so the IPv4, because the IPv4 address is so short. But uh, there may be, you know, the alliance may function as sort of like similar to ICANN in the way that it would help manage. Uh, the risk of conflicts and, and the distance between uh, the vendors' um, uh, codec IDs. Uh, the other thing is that this technology is just so early, like we don't even know what a drive would look like or how it would function yet. Uh, there's uh, various different you know, ex uh, experiments and, and papers and uh, everything uh, coming through, but the technology is going to evolve uh, quite a lot, especially in the next five years. Uh, and so I think the, uh, the, these core concepts of the codex, in the address space and dealing with the medium from a from a uh, you know a specification perspective that will fall on the uh, that will fall into the roadmap uh, which is the other working group uh, as part of the um, alliance. Do you have a question? Yeah, I don't get the address. So you, uh, the PCR, the simple way to think about it is you do like a test to go, hey, what what uh, format is this drive in? And so there's a, a, a like a a false positive issue of, hey, I I make it a false positive to say that this is actually in a different format than I would expect. So this is just the sector zero, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, but because it's part of that same archive, it creates this. So in order for us to reason about it, we kind of need to go, what's the appropriate distance and, and, and things? Yeah, yeah. Because it, it's not a singular sec, like sector in a key value store. It has a relationship with it, with with the other, you know, strains. So he's working, lots of working assumptions on the current technology. So, you know, we'll go through and build the error model and so forth, but that technology might get uh, better and therefore expand the address space, for example, and that over time. There's, uh, I think, it's, we, we don't have an idea of what's the likely number of codecs and how quickly that may evolve. Uh, but I also think that, you know, I've worked on the computational storage uh, briefly uh, uh, a few years ago. And uh, I think that uh, the DNA medium is quite fascinating. So there's lots of aspects, especially that come out of standardizing codecs, and then having an archive that you know you're trying to send queries to and determine the state of. But I think there might maybe a lot of nice alignment with the, the you know the, the computational storage uh, standard, which is you know in a, in a V1 now, which is great. Uh, yeah. So the, so that last point, just especially that there are going to be a lot of novel. Uh, mechanisms as a result of DNA. It's not just for storage, but if you look at, the, for example, like the, the search indexing, that, that has lots of capabilities that, you know, you traditionally not, you, you would traditionally be abstracted on top of SCSI, not looking at seeing those queries down. Uh, and so how we incorporate that into the storage model, I think, is going to is going to be quite fascinating. All right. That's a, back to George. Joel. Ready for another dad joke? <laughs> All right, so uh, how to participate. Uh, obviously, standards only succeed when you have um, a lot of information coming from a lot of different places, from a lot of different constituents. So we would love to have everyone join in and help. Lots of different ways to get involved. Uh, first is go to the DNA Storage Alliance website, sign up for the newsletter. There's a lot of really good material out there on DNA data storage and the underlying fundamental principles that enable the technology. Um, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, our goal really is to you know, grow the working group uh, to the right size. We've got a really good base of representation right now, but obviously we could use more because with more, we get more opinions and more input and more expertise. So uh, we wanna make sure we have adequate coverage across you know, uh, public, private, academia, you know, you name it. So to summarize, so there's a lot of promise with DNA data storage. As Dave mentioned, it's extremely dense. Uh, it doesn't have the same power constraints uh, or cooling constraints that traditional media has. Lasts a really long time out in the wild. Dave's woolly mammoth example. So now I have to give two people a nickel every time I use the analogy. So the the goop and the woolly mammoth, those are two really good ones. And you know, you, you couple that with what's happening in the world. Uh, you know, Dave hit the nail on the head with uh, the infographic that he showed earlier. People are hanging on to data, not because they need to. Of course they need to. There, there's a subset of the data that they need to hold on to, but there's also just the unknown. And I think a lot of us get paralyzed by fear. And if you are a storage admin, um, whether it's at a public or private company or a hyperscale or whatever the case may be, there might be gold that's unrealized in the data that you're about to toss. And so what are they doing? They're, they're hoarding, right? Pretty soon, you know, 10 years from now, there's going to be a popular show on Netflix called Data Hoarders. And we're going to have to go live through the adventure of a random IT storage admin who's going through these exabytes of data. And he's like, do I keep it? Do I put it on DNA? What do I, what do, I do? That's happening. That's happening now because nobody knows what data is going to be able to be extracted from that data in 5, 10, 20 years time. So they're, they're hanging on to it. Uh, there's a, a multi-stage process to go from data through DNA and back to data. So the process involving encoding, synthesizing, physical storage, retrieval, sequencing, and then decoding. There's a really good overview of that in the, uh, the white paper that's linked at the beginning of the presentation. Would really encourage you to you know, take a look through it. It was very informative to me. Um, most of the people that I've shared it with have, have agreed that it was extremely informative to them too. Uh, 
Uh, DNA as a storage media does not share many of the properties that you know, we enjoy with traditional media. There's no built-in controller, there's no built-in metadata, there's no proximity or addressability regarding a uh, position of a certain piece of information versus the head of the archive or the tail of the archive, which presents a unique problem because we need to be able to figure out how to read an archive without knowing how to read an archive. So uh, you can see some of the challenges that we're going through uh, as Alessia and Mark um, you know, talk to those. So that's really the goal of the Rosetta Stone. We want to be that box that's in between a person trying to read an archive and on the other side of that box, their actual ability to be able to do something useful and meaningful with that archive. So with that, um, thank you for your time. I'd uh, love to you know, answer any questions that you have. I've got two smart people here with me. And um, you know, if I get in over my head, so, yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that you know the 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 embodiment that these archives will take on is you know yet to be determined. If you're are you familiar with um, Simon Wardley's mapping techniques? He's got this um, this mapping system called Wardley mapping, and it essentially takes any technology stack and breaks it into its constituent components, and then outlays outlays those components into one of four areas, either. Uh, genesis, custom, product, or commodity. And essentially what this allows you to do is understand where uh, each of those components are in terms of the general availability and consistency of that particular part of you know, the, the stack. And in the case of DNA, the vast majority of it is over in genesis to custom. So like we, we can't say with any degree of certainty that uh, an archive is going to be you know, this, Full of you know the the goop, or if it's going to be um, a thousand what look like little nine millimeter casings, right? That are in a in a tray, and that tray gets slotted into a slot in a catalog that has a robotic mechanism like tape. Or there's sure. Yeah, I think it's it's a it's an excellent question because it it's I think that you know the the state of the art is is going to be continually evolving. I, I think that you know there will likely um, as the the ecosystems mature for you know sequencing and synthesizing, we're likely to start seeing uh, the the technology get faster and smaller. Um, and there was a point made earlier about amortizing the cost of those fixed elements over the amount of data that you're storing and the cost per gigabyte of the, of the media. I, I think as those two domains uh, improve from a cost performance perspective and also a form factor perspective, it's likely that we'll shift from a traditional you know, central synthesizer sequencer type of architecture with a bunch of you know, trays of containers into something where we might you know, in the future, and you know, this I, I I don't have any inside information on. This is just you know me brainstorming, uh, but could potentially see that actually embedded in something that is that is pluggable. You know, that might be in the future of DNA. Yeah, that, that's a great point. So, you know, a couple of things on that. The first is I think that whatever uh, container, and by the way, did you want to jump in on any of the previous, you guys are good? Okay. Um, sorry, I, you know, tend to just like steamroll. And, <laughs> I, I think there's, there's two elements to that. The first is whatever the container form factor is, we're likely to have a sector zero in every one of those containers. I think uh, where there's going to be some incredible innovation uh, I, I think Mark touched on it a little bit ago, is what levels of intelligence you embed in the abstractions above the top of those. 
I think the um, if I think about a file system today, uh, this is, in my opinion, uh, you know, one of the more powerful analogies that have come to mind. Uh, you have linked lists of inodes, right? But if you think about um, the construction of a, a, an oligonucleotide having a sequence of bases, if you understand that sequence of bases, rather than traversing a list, you might be able to do something like build a graph. And you might be able to do that not only within the container, but across the top of those containers in that logical representation that sits on top of those. So I think um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be really exciting to see it mature and evolve. So the, the assumption today is that uh, sector zero will be written in when the archive is written. So the, um, from a, uh, one of the, the underlay assumptions there being that it's a write once uh, type of archive. So when you have you know, some number of gigabytes or terabytes that you want to write uh, and you are synthesizing and then storing into the container, uh, you are also synthesizing sector zero into that same container with it. Does it? Are you including right with what's updatable? Are you including no append? So there's there's the assumptions that the the working group is making. Uh, and then there are, um, you know, there's there's space that we want to leave for innovation by the vendors that actually produce the systems that would adhere to the spec. Uh, the operating assumption is that there does need to be some extensibility, whether that is uh, write replace or update. Uh, so there's there's consideration for that. The the ability to you know non destructively read is you know quite challenging. Uh, Dave alluded to some of the uh, the mechanisms for you know reading the um, sequence by synthesis being one of those. There, there's a, a lot of things that have yet to be you know completely thought through. Do you want to add anything to that? Oh yeah, they are. That's that's a faux pas on my part. I got them uploaded last night. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, there there was a there were, there were a couple slides that we we had some uh, discussions on internally that um, it was going to be this version or a slightly different version. And <laughs> sorry about that. Hundred percent. Yeah. And if they're not, I can give you a copy here. So <laughs> thanks everyone. Appreciate it.